there this morning is taken from Romans chapter 11, from 33. Romans 11 from verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him all things are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here ends the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Great. Thank you very much for reading that. Keep that passage open. I came up into the pulpit a moment ago and read it. I realized I left my notes down there. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that as we meditate on your word, you would speak to us in the very depths of your being by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, now, what with uh, New Year's uh, resolutions and all that, January is a great time of year to be thinking about motivation, what motivates us. So would you describe yourself as a motivated kind of person? Are you the kind of person who sets a goal and then goes hard after it until it's accomplished? Or do you tend ugh, to run out of steam? Okay. Most of us are a bit of a mix, aren't we? We're motivated, we're motivated to do some things enthusiastically, but there are other things, well, we're not so keen and haven't quite got the enthusiasm for it, so maybe one day I'll, I'll do it. And motivation is such an important thing in life. You know, it's what makes you... Um, get some exercise, it's what makes you uh, get out of job and uh, get out of bed in the morning, it's what makes you work hard or aim high or achieve something new or do something difficult that you don't particularly enjoy. And the key thing about motivation is why. Motivation is all about why we do something, the reason that we're doing it. When you realize you actually, you know, have no real reason to do the thing you're supposed to be doing, you kind of think, oh, what's the point? And you, you, know, you give up doing it. But when you have a compelling reason to do something, you get on with it, even if it's something that at times you find difficult. For example, I basically hate getting up early in the morning. And even more than getting up early in the morning, I hate doing any form of exercise too early in the morning. And yet you will regularly these days find me out before the sun is up going for a walk. And that is because I you know, have a relatively recently new motivation in my life in the form of an impatient cocker spaniel who will not you know, let us uh, lie in bed but wants to go for a walk. So motivation is the thought at the beginning of this chapter, uh, at the beginning of Romans chapter 12. And the question here is, why are you trying to live your life like a Christian? Why live the Christian life? So this is where we're going on Sunday mornings, over the next couple of months, we're going to camp out in Romans chapters 12 and 13. We normally go a bit faster with, than that with Bible passages and Bible books, but this term we're going to sort of slow down and have a look at what these chapters say about what it means to live life as Christians, as Christians together and on our own. Um, some weeks we're just going to linger over just one verse, and that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to focus on verse 1 of chapter 12. Okay, so it's a super helpful verse to get into our heads and hearts on the first Sunday of a new year because in one verse it contains the what and the why of being a Christian. The what and the why 
of the Christian life. What am I supposed to be doing as a follower of Jesus? And why am I supposed to be doing it? Motivation. So have a look at that verse again. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And even though it's just one verse, I think we can boil it down to the two most important words in, in that one verse. The two key words are the words mercy and sacrifice. Sacrifice is the what of the Christian life, and mercy is the why, the motivation. So let's start with the what. What are we supposed to be doing in our Christian lives? Okay. How does Paul answer that question here? What are we supposed to be doing in our Christian lives? What's his answer? He says we're supposed to be offering our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Now, what does that mean? Lit literal religious sacrifices would have just been part of everyday life for Paul's first readers. They saw people offering sacrifices in temples all over Rome. They would have grasped his meaning really clearly. But, you know, that might not be part of life in modern Plymouth, but we know what he means when he uses the word sacrifice. We still use the word today. We might say something like, for example, we might say, if you want to be a member of the first team, you're going to have to sacrifice your evenings and go to training. Yeah? Or we might say of someone in a slightly different way, we might say, well, she's a full-time carer now, and that's meant sacrificing her social life. Okay? So what is a sacrifice? Sacrifice is when you give up something. You let go of something that might otherwise be yours for a greater cause. Now, I want to be in the first team, so I'm willing to sacrifice, give up my evenings, but I wouldn't give up my mornings, by the way, for exercise. Or I love this person, so I'm willing to sacrifice, give up my social life to care for them. And Paul says, with that sort of thought in mind, sacrifice, he says we're to do that with our whole lives. To say, to say God, you are so important to me that I am willing to hand over my life to you. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now, it's possible that we might hear that and think, oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can do that. You know, that sounds like, I don't know, uh, advanced level Christianity. It sounds very dramatic. I mean, I can't just give up my life. I've got commitments. I've got responsibilities. I can't just drop everything. What does, what does Paul mean? When you glance through the rest of the chapter, which we're going to, you know, we are going to look at it in much more detail over the coming weeks, you see, you know, see Paul isn't, he's not talking about just dropping everything, or almost dropping out of life. He's, he's talking about, no, how we live our daily lives. He's going to talk about how we use our talents, how we treat each other, how we handle, um, you know, the bumps on the road in life, setbacks and sickness, how we react to success and, and failure, how we respond to people who aren't very nice to us and so on. I don't know if you remember, it's two or three years ago now, a guy called John Dunnett came and preached for us and he said, his way of thinking about this, I remember this sticking in my mind, he said when his alarm goes off in the morning, ugh, is what you think, isn't it? But he says after that first thought, uh, he says what you do is you sit up, you swing your legs off the bed, you plant your feet on the ground, and you say, Jesus, today is for you. Whatever happens next is for you. That's the attitude with which to go into the day. Okay? How, how does that lovely old hymn put it? I, I should have um, suggested we sang it today. Do you remember how it goes? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee take my life. Except verse 1 doesn't quite say, take my life. It's a bit more concrete even than that, isn't it? He, he says in verse 1, he says, offer your bodies. Because my physical body is the way that I give myself to God in daily life. You know, where, 
where I go with my feet, what, type, what I type with my hands on a keyboard, what I, what I say with my lips to people, the things that I think with my brain, the things I look at with my eyes. I want it to be holy and pleasing to you, O Lord. That's what it means to offer yourself, your body, to God. So I like the way that the message translation of the Bible puts verse 1. I don't know if you've come across the message translation. It's not a very uh, literal kind of translation. It tries to paraphrase things in modern language a bit. And in this verse, it's quite helpful the way it puts it. It, it. it puts it like this. Here's what I want you to do, says Paul. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. I like, I like the way it puts that. Every day, ordinary life, that's where, that's where our sacrifice to God takes place as we offer ourselves to him. Now, why does Paul use this language of, of sacrifice? Because, you know, he could have said this kind of thing in a, in a different way. He could have said, for example, devote yourselves to doing what is good, and that's the way he says it in Titus chapter 3. Or he could have said, different way of saying it, he could have said, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. You know, live like that, live like Jesus. And he says it that way in, in 1 Corinthians. But here he says it using the language of sacrifice. Why, why say it this way? Why sum up the Christian life as a sacrifice, as worship? Well, I think what's happening is Paul is harking back to something that he said right at the beginning of the letter of Romans. At the beginning of Romans, Paul explains, he's explaining there, what, you know, what's gone wrong with the world? What's gone wrong with us? And this is what he says. He says, this is Romans chapter 1, verse 25. He says, they, he says, we exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped, there's that worship word, worshipped and served created things rather than our creator. He's saying we were made to worship our creator, we were made to worship God, and we have let other things become more important to us than him. And so when Paul describes what it means to live life as a Christian, he's using the language of worship here. In our lives, we are reversing what has gone wrong in the world and in our own lives. The Christian life is about putting God back at the center in the place of worship where he belongs, as the thing which is most worthy in our lives. Not just when you go to the temple, or for us, when you, you, know, you go to church. Worship doesn't just happen at 11.15 on a Sunday morning. Paul is saying, worship is what I do with my body for the rest of the week. And it starts every morning when my feet land on the floor, and I go, today, today, Jesus, is for you. Lord, here I am, I'm yours Here's my body, I want to use it in ways which are holy and pleasing to you. Now we can unpack that a lot more and that's what Paul's gonna do over the coming uh, verses in chapters 12 and 13. Here's the question I wanna focus on this morning then is why would we do that? We've done the what, what am I supposed to be doing as a Christian? In general terms, that's the word sacrifice. But why? Why am I supposed to be doing that? And the word to focus on here is the word mercy. God's mercy to us. Look, Paul says in verse 1 again, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So mercy is the motivation. God's mercy to, to us. And you'll have noticed that that verse begins with the word therefore, which reminds us that Romans 12 Romans 12 is not the beginning of the book. Romans 12 follows on from Romans 1 to 11. See how good I am at counting? This is one of the great turning points in Paul's letter. And the logic is, Romans 1 to 11, therefore, Romans 12. Okay. So what has Romans 1 to 11 been all about? What is it that Paul has been talking about that makes him go, therefore, in view of all that, offer your bodies as a sacrifice to God. I mean, you can tell from the beginning of the verse what it is, can't you? Therefore, in view of God's mercy, Romans 1 to 11 has been all about God's mercy to us. In fact, there are four great therefores in the book of Romans. 
But just have a look at them with me now. The first great therefore is in chapter three. Just turn back to chapter three. So on page 1130, chapter three, verse nine says, chapter three and verse nine says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles, everyone alike, are all under sin. And then he describes our sin, and look how he describes it. In, for example, in verse 13, he talks about our throats, our tongues, our lips, our mouths, our feet. It's also physical, again. We can either use our bodies to worship God, Romans 12, or to rebel against him, Romans 3. And so in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, therefore, here's the first great therefore, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight. We're all sinners. We're all condemned. We all deserve God's justice, his judgment, his wrath, as Romans puts it. But, turn to chapter 5 and verse 1. Here is the second great therefore. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To be justified is to be declared righteous, and, and therefore, that is an astonishing statement. We who were unrighteous are declared righteous through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross. He put himself in our place, and in our place, he took the justice, the judgment, the wrath of God that we deserved. And now we have peace with God through him. This is the mercy Romans 12 is talking about. Which brings us to the third great therefore of Romans, which is in chapter 8 and verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I, I am a sinner. I have used the body God gave me not to worship him, but to rebel against him in all kinds of ways. And here he is saying, yeah, but there's, there's no condemnation for you now, Joe, or whatever your name is. What a great mercy. And that brings us to the final great therefore of Romans, the, 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 the therefore we're looking at this morning, the therefore we're looking at this term, Romans 12 verse 1, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So what's Paul saying? He's saying mercy, this mercy he's taken 11 chapters to unpack, this mercy makes a difference. So that's the title we're giving this series, this term, Mercy Makes a Difference, because of what God has done for me through Jesus. And, and actually that word mercy doesn't come out just here. It, it's actually plural in view of God's mercies. Paul is underlining how much God has done for us. In view of God's mercies, I want my life to be his life, offered to him, holy to him, pleasing to him. Christopher Ashe has a, a lovely way of talking about this. He talks about the music of grace, the melody of mercy. And he says that melody ought to be the soundtrack to, to our lives. Um, you probably watched some films over, the, over Christmas time. Uh, we tried to watch all the Lord of the Rings uh, films over Christmas. I fell asleep in the first one. And we haven't quite done the third one yet, has it? But we love Lord of the Rings. And um, I just noticed as, as you're watching it that when certain characters crop up, certain melodies in the film score sort of float back in, in, over the top of it. So when the hobbits are, are in it, there's that lovely melody that's associated with the Shire, isn't there? Or if you're watching something like uh, Star Wars, when Darth Vader walks on, it's da 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 isn't it? You know? And then when Luke comes on, I, what, shall I try singing it? <laughs> no chance okay so there are these there are these melodies associated with people so as a christian you know you probably don't have grandiose thoughts like this but as you're walking around you have a soundtrack playing playing in your background of your mind probably not but the melody that you should have is 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 a, the melody of mercy let's call it that the music of of grace and when we become christians that melody is playing loudly we get it God loves me, despite everything about me. God loves me, and we want to live our lives for him. 
But as life goes on, the melody of mercy, well, it can do, it can fade into the background. And we kind of forget a little bit that the reason I'm a Christian, the reason I'm trying to, to live life as a Christian is because God has been so good to me. I'm not just trying to be good. I'm trying to be good for God because God has been good to me. And I spoke with someone recently, someone round about my age, so, you know, mid-30s or something, so who's, who's been, a, a, been a Christian for a good while. But, but the phrase he used, he said, I've just kind of got bored with the Christian life. And I think that was, really, that was super honest. And I think one of the reasons for that is that he'd forgotten, to some extent, the melody of mercy. That mercy makes a difference. That's our motivation. In fact, the point Paul makes at the end of verse 1, look how it ends. He says, he says offer your bodies as, a living, as living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. That, that word spiritual actually means something like reasonable or logical. So the verse reads like this, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your logical act of worship. So to offer our bodies to God each morning, Paul is saying, is the most logical thing we could do in view of what God has done for us. He's saying anything less than a total, complete sacrifice of ourselves to God is completely irrational. If you give yourself partially or half-heartedly or boredly to God, he's saying you're simply not thinking. You are not looking at what Jesus did for you. It doesn't make sense if you approach your life like that now. This is why one of our mottos at St. Andrew's is let's keep Christ front and center. He and what he's done and the mercy we've received through him makes a difference. That's our motivation. Now, you probably, like I said, we've been watching a few movies over Christmas. You probably feel like you've watched enough movies already over Christmas. But there's a new movie coming out starring Anthony Hopkins, which I'm keen to see, called One Life. Has, that, has anyone seen it yet? One or two people at the first service this morning had seen it. Yeah, at the back there, Pauline's seen it. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the trailer. It intrigued me when I, when I saw it. So I looked up the story, and it's a true story about a man called Nicholas Winton. He died in 2015 at the ripe old age of 106. But when he was a young man, just before the outbreak of World War II, he helped to rescue 669 Jewish children from Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia by organizing a series of trains that carried the children to safety in Britain. And he, he kept his heroic, that heroic deed secret for 50 years until Esther Ranson found out about it in 1988. So do you remember Esther Ranson and the TV show That's Life? Some of us do. If you're older than your mid-30s, some of you re remember that. And she got Nicholas Winton onto the show. And you can find this clip online. I think it's on YouTube or on the BBC website about the movie, I think. And Nicholas Winton is sitting in the front row. He's about 80 years old at this stage. And Esther Ranson starts telling the story of one of the children that he rescued. And then she says, Mr. Winton, that person is sitting next to you. And he had no idea. And that person had no idea the person sitting next to her was Nicholas Winton. In fact, then, Esther Ranson says, she said, would anyone else in the studio who was on one of Mr. Winton's trains, would you please stand up? And dozens of adults in the studio stood up and got to their feet. And it's such a beautiful moment. And you can see by the look on their faces what they're thinking of Mr. Winton. And what do you think that is? What would that be? It's gratitude, isn't it? It's affection, of course. They're certainly not yawning. There's no couldn't care less attitude. His uh, mercy, as it were, made such a massive difference to their lives. Now that is the vibe of this passage. That's the feel of what Paul is saying just here. We must feel and think kind of like that towards Jesus Christ because of what he's done for us. It's probably our hymns that say it best. Remember how it goes in uh, 
uh, the, the hymn, Love So Amazing, So Divine, Demands My Life, My Soul, My All. So if we're flagging in the Christian life, if it's feeling a bit of a drudge, middle-aged boredom with it, or whatever it is, let's turn up the volume of the melody of mercy in our lives. Let's live our lives to that soundtrack, back to Christ, who he is, what he's done for me. As we make our way through Romans 12 and 13 this term, as we offer our lives to God each day, let's do it because we're motivated by the mercy of God. Mercy makes a difference, and let's pray that that would be the case in our own lives. Let me lead us in prayer now. In view of God's mercy. Well, Heavenly Father, we pray for a clear view of your mercy. Where we're feeling colder or cooler towards these things, where they seem distant, we pray they become more vivid, clear to our minds and our hearts. Help us to fix our eyes on Christ and the mercy you have shown to us through him. And in response to that, Lord, in view of that, motivate us, empower us, enable us to offer ourselves, our bodies, Heavenly Father, to you in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.